So this topic of, of aware and awake, um, I really like this topic because it really is the essence of, of, of what this is all about. Um, when I first came across the Brahma Kumaris, which was in 1990, so it's the 20th of August, 1990 was the very first day I set foot in a BK centre here in Cambridge, where I was Cambridge, UK, where I still live. Um, and I was off work with stress. Uh, my doctor had signed me off. Um, he, he actually asked me what to put on the uh, certificate for signing me off from work, um, which, which surprised me a little bit and, and actually disappointed me a little bit because as the stress had been building up inside me over, I guess, many years, I suppose I always felt that if it ever got bad enough that I would be off work and would have to go and seek medical help, that medical science would have an understanding of what it was that I was experiencing and what I was going through. And more important than just having an understanding of it, they would actually have some solution to it. Um, you know, that probably is because I have a very strong science background myself, but at school, I was not so interested in um, the arts and languages. Uh, you know, I was forced to do them because of the school I went to. You had to learn Latin for the first two years, which um, at the time didn't seem very relevant. But it's actually quite useful when you try and understand the origins of words and, and the real root meaning of words. So, you know, it, it, later on, I thought maybe that had a bit of benefit. Uh, I also was uh, required to learn a modern language, so I, I did French for a few years, um, which was not very good. I mean, it was schoolboy French until I got a French girlfriend when I was 17 and for the next four or five years spent a lot of vacations in, in France um, and some of her relatives didn't speak any English. So it's a great way to learn a language is be in a country where you have to interact with people who don't speak English. Um, but apart from that, I was really much more interested in science. Uh, so I did, um, when I came to A-levels, I did pure mathematics, uh, applied mathematics and physics, uh, and then went on to university to study engineering. Electronics engineering is, is my degree. And so I was working in that, that area, working for a consultancy here in Cambridge. Uh, I moved here in 1983 to, uh, to work for this firm here, Cambridge Consultants. Um, doing technology development for clients in all sorts of organizations, applying science and technology and engineering to, to business problems and how to develop new products and new manufacturing processes. So I was very much of that mindset of, of analysis and working things out and, and a real kind of foundational faith that science either had the answers to everything or given enough time would have the answers to everything. So this was why I was a bit disappointed when the doctor said to me, look, you know, um, what would you like me to put on your certificate? Because it made it very clear that he didn't really understand what it was I was going through. Um, it, there was nothing wrong externally. I'm happily married, good job, as I mentioned, um, doing well in my career, been promoted to running group of people in 86. So that's three or four years earlier. Um, a healthy child, Alexander, was born in 89. So yeah, everything that you tend to think of as being the success criteria for modern life, um, I had ticks in all the boxes. So there was nothing really that you could point to that would suggest that I should be at all unhappy about anything. Um, but the, the GP recognized that I was stressed and, and anxious, uh, depressed, um, you know, couldn't cope, overloaded, not sleeping, all those sorts of things. And so when he signed me off, he asked me, as I say, what, what to put on my certificate. We, we eventually agreed that acute anxiety was probably a reasonable summary of it. But it did make me wonder about the whole thing about how much faith I'd placed purely in scientific understanding of the self. Um, because the fact that there weren't any immediate answers. And so he then referred me on and I you know, went through some medical tests, nothing wrong on the physical level. And eventually he referred me to the guy who runs psychotherapy or ran psychotherapy here at uh, Cambridge University's teaching hospital. And um, the, the thing there really was that I thought, well, you know, okay, so if, if there is an understanding of the self, that will explain what it is I'm going through, then surely the guy who is running the department 
at the teaching hospital associated with Cambridge University, one of the top half dozen universities on the planet. Surely this guy will have answers to what it is that is going on and you know what's wrong and, and what I need to do about it. So I went to see this character. Um, this would have been you know summertime of 1990. And as a private patient, the firm I worked for had private medical insurance. So I went to see this guy um, under that insurance cover out of his consulting rooms in one of the villages just north of Cambridge. And, uh, you know, e even in my depressed state, I was kind of a, sort of a bit amused by the setup because it literally looked like something out of a movie, you know, with the, the couch. And uh, he didn't have a little goatee beard and he didn't speak with an Austrian accent. But apart from that, everything else was, was kind of in place. Um, and as a bit of me was a little bit disappointed that I didn't get to lie on the couch because, you know, you sort of seem to think that that's, you know, if you see cartoons and movies and, and, and uh, uh, you know, sort of comedy acts around this sort of scene uh, of a therapist's office, the, you know, the patient is always lying on the couch and the therapist is behind them with a notebook, you know, asking questions, uh, deep questions. But this was just like a normal sitting across a, a table to each other and, and chatting. Um, and that evening was a three hour consultation where he literally took apart my whole life. Like, you know, my experiences of being a young child, experience of my parents, experience with my two elder sisters, um, experiences at school, uh, experiences with girlfriends, experiences with friends, sports, you name it. I mean, basically every aspect of, of my life, you know, girlfriends, being married, um, being, being a father, all of these aspects, he really just unpicked and unpacked. And at the end of this three hour session, and obviously I can laugh about it now with, you know, 30 odd years of hindsight. At the time, it wasn't very humorous, I can tell you. At the end of this session, he looked at me over those little half glasses that they always wear, you know, that makes them look very educated and, and um, professional. Um, and he said to me, you should be happy. So this was, you know, the best diagnosis of the top psychotherapist at Cambridge University's teaching hospital. Um, you should be happy. This was his professional diagnosis. And, um, you know, of course, with the benefit of those 30 years of hindsight, what he was clearly saying was, look, there are, there are no real traumas there in your life that, that might explain why you should be unhappy. You know, you ought to be able to have a happy, fulfilling, contented life. Um, so, you know, the, there's, there's, there's nothing really major to worry about. So that was, I guess, his message. Unfortunately, what I heard was, well, um, whatever it is that you've got, I don't know what it is. I mean, that was, that was the message I picked up from that consultation. And so with a lot of aspiration going into that meeting, that if anybody had answers to my questions, it would be this guy. I left there even more depressed than when I arrived, which I guess wasn't the outcome either of us wanted. But, you know, sometimes life does these sorts of things. It, it, it exerts pressure and um, beats us around the head with a metaphorical baseball bat um, until we awake, until we, today's topic, aware and awake, until we wake up to the fact that maybe we need to be doing something different. And of course, that's a hard message to understand at the time because you can't immediately see, and I couldn't immediately see what was it that I might be doing wrong that, that was leading to this experience. So anyway, um, having been disappointed there and, you know, he sent me off to see a, a Jungian counsellor and, and that was quite interesting in the sense that at the same time, I'd started to go to the BK Centre in Cambridge and, and those of you who know um, the Cambridge setup here, Dr. Prashant Kekade is the guy who runs the centre, is a ear, nose and throat surgeon by profession um, that got into BK meditation about, I guess, must be nearly 40 years ago now. Um, so he was running the centre, still runs the centre today. And uh, what was really useful for me was because I have this, as I mentioned, maths, physics background, and he has a background as a ear, nose and throat surgeon, there's a lot of intellectual depth in his, in, in his understanding of the, the, the philosophical roots and, and the knowledge base of the BK philosophy. 
And so and I'll come back to talk about meditation in, in a little while, because I know in the preamble, some of you were saying, you know, meditation is not necessarily easy. And I would concur with that. I mean, for me, it was extremely difficult. It took me years and years and years to really get to grips with meditation. And I think that directly links back to this clever head, ability to think, um, analyze, scientific understanding, and quite frankly, a very high IQ. I mean, I had my IQ tested um, back in the 1980s, um, and, and it was measured at 154, which is, depending on which of the two, there's a couple of charts that you can use to assess that. Depending on which one you use, now 154 is between one in 2,000 people and one in 6,000 people. And so one of the downsides of, of that clever head, if you like, is that it can become very much a foundational part of one's sense of self in the world. And certainly at school, now because I came from a working class family, my dad was a factory worker, my mum was a, a cook in a school kitchen. Um, and I got lots of messages from teachers and my parents got lots of messages from teachers. Your Jeff is very clever. He was really, really smart. You know, you need to get him to grammar school. You need to, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so that's what happened. I passed my 11 plus, which in those days, those of you who are old enough and from the UK will, will remember that, that there was this grading uh, examination done at the age of 11, around about the age of 11. And if you passed it, you were uh, able to go into grammar school, which was this sort of tiered education system. So, so this happened for me and, and I ended up going to this school and clearly because of this kind of IQ heady um, persona, um, the, the, the maths and physics became the subjects that I just, I could do them. I didn't really need to try very hard. I mean, they were just really easy and, and quite frankly, I was quite lazy. So I was attracted to the things that, uh, that were easy to do. But it, but it is an impediment when it comes to other aspects of life. And, and, and in a way, what happens is that there's this saying that when you're proud of your hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so when you're proud of the ability to think analytically and understand concepts and models and, and technical ideas, there's a real gravitational pull towards using that aspect of the self at the expense of the other side of the self, which is to do with your feelings and, if you like, your, your virtues, your, your human qualities, the ability to, to be compassionate, the ability to care, the ability to be supportive, all of these sorts of things that make us human as opposed to machines. Um, and unfortunately, our whole system of society really has um, respected and honoured the clever head much more than the big heart. So, so we have an education system that very much focuses on um, I, IQ, being clever, remembering things, being able to um, talk convincingly about things, all, all these sorts of skills that are important, but they're only really half of, of what it means to be human. So um, when I was you know, off work with stress and trying to deal with this situation, uh, my wife, Alison, was looking at meditation classes in Cambridge. And, and this was really because her mother, um, Doreen, who, who passed away eight years ago now, um, she'd always suffered from arthritis. And so she went along to yoga classes, Hatha yoga classes for the exercises and the movement and to maybe get some more joint mobility. But she noticed that very often people would become so relaxed during these yoga sessions that they would, you know, <laughs> back of the class as somebody nodded off because they were so relaxed for the first time in ages so she said to Alison why don't you take Jeff off to do some uh, some yoga and so Alison bless her looked at all the yoga classes in Cambridge and of course this being the summer of 1990 summertime or late summer um, the 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 university you know, the students weren't here. And so it's so quite a seasonal place, Cambridge. You can imagine that with all the university um, and, and other colleges as well, I mean, Cambridge University itself is not the only educational institution here. Um, so there's a lot of influx of people in term time and they go away uh, when the terms are finished. And so classes like yoga and things often are not active in the summer. So she rang around and various places were closed. And this is before the internet, of course, so you couldn't look them up online. Um, and she found this uh, advertisement in the local library for something called Raja Yoga, which turns out to be, some of you will know, 
the form of meditation that the BKs teach. So um, she rang up, uh, spoke to Prashant, who I mentioned earlier, uh, and he said, um, you know, come along, we made this appointment for the 20th of August. Uh, and, and he said his final comment before putting the phone down was, by the way, you do realize that this is yoga for the mind and not for the body. And what does that mean, you know? Um, because back then, uh, my understanding of yoga, and I guess it's like the, the predominant prevailing view of yoga today, to, the, to, to this day, is that it's about physical exercises. It's about, you know, writhing around on the floor on a mat, um, wearing lycra, lycra leggings and that kind of thing. I'm not sure they had lycra leggings back then. But anyway, the, the whole vision in my mind of yoga was, was a very physical activity. Um, and so this, this comment that this is yoga for the mind was really, um, on the one hand, surprising, but also quite intriguing because clearly the problems I, were, I was having was with my mind, you know, the particular physical problems. It was just, you know, what was going on inside my head was, was the big issue. And so we went along that evening and um, as luck had it, um, Prashant himself didn't meet us that first day. He said hello. But then he passed us on to um, one of the other students there, um, a young lady by the name of Kathy. And what was interesting about Kathy is she'd been go going along to the meditation center for a couple of years. And, and one of the things that I guess many of you will have experienced if you've been involved in, in BK um, practice for some time is when you yourself start to experience benefit from applying these ideas to your awareness and to remaining awake, then there's a, there's a natural kind of human inclination, tendency, desire to share that benefit with others, you know, family, friends, um, people that you know, who maybe are also uh, facing challenges in their life. And if you've found that you have received some benefit yourself, then there's a natural human compassion and um, tendency to want to help others too. And so Kathy had said to Prashant, you know, could I maybe have a, you know, somebody who comes along for the first time, could I speak with them and, and give them their introduction to the, these ideas uh, and the practice of meditation? And so that, that was why I ended up in front of Kathy. And what was great about this was that, um, unlike the guy at um, Cambridge University's teaching hospital, she had no medical qualifications, no background, but what she did have was two years experience of meditation. And so th this particular evening, she said to me, um, can you explain, you know, what, what's your interest in meditation? Why have you come along? And I said, well, you know, I explained the backstory, work off work with stress and uh, all this kind of thing. And, um, you know, she sort of asked me to explain a little bit more about that. And I said, well, you know, you know, I'm married to Alison and therefore, you know, obviously I care about her and our relationship. And then Alexander, you know, he, he's our son. I mean, you know, he'd been born a year before. And so I felt responsibility for him. And then, I've got my work responsibilities, you know, I'm running some, some big projects for clients uh, and they're quite important to the firm I work for. And then, you know, my mum and dad are getting older and so obviously I'm concerned about them and I've got my sisters and you know, friends and all these sorts of things. And I said, you know, it just feels like I'm being pulled in all these different directions all the time. And particularly this issue of work versus um, family, immediate family responsibilities where, there'd been a particular clash where um, the only day that a big client of ours in Holland could make a, a major meeting for a project that I was managing, the only day they could make that meeting was um, on Alex's first birthday. So 16th of May, 1990 was his first birthday. So, and I literally felt like I'd been being torn apart by these two forces, almost like, you know, tectonic plates, You've seen this, um, um, volcano that's gone up over uh, Tonga in, in recent days, but it's like this felt like these tectonic forces literally ripping me in, into two, you know, like Jeff, the dad wants to be at Alex's birthday party and, and Jeff, the consultant um, desperately wants to be at the client meeting, you know, two areas of responsibility that feel really, really important to me. And so this felt like being pulled apart and I could really identify this as a major source of the stress and, and the anxiety and, and the worry that I was experiencing because I couldn't understand why it was I feeling the way I was. I, I, other colleagues seemed to be able to cope with these things, but, but I didn't seem to be able to and I didn't know why. So um, Kathy listened to this and she said to me, she said, oh, that's easy. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm really intrigued at this point because 
I've, you know, I've explained all of this to the head of psychotherapy at Cambridge University's teaching hospital, and he, he seems clueless. <laughs> and he's like a top guy in his field, you know, super big, you know, plaque, you know, qualifications, plaques all over the wall and, you know, doctor, professor, this, that and the other. Uh, and here's somebody who's got no qualifications whatsoever telling me that my problem is easy. So I, I'm at this point very, very curious to hear what she has to say. And what she then said, what came out of her mouth in the next sentence was literally the foundation of, of what I've been working on. Uh, ever since really for the for the last 31 uh, into the 32 years um, time so she said uh, your problem is you don't know who you are I'm sorry I think I do I mean you know I have certificates I can I can bring them in and show you and she said no no she said you think that you are Jeff Alexander's dad you think that you are the consultant you think you're Alison's husband you think you're Mary and Anne's brother you think you're Sadie and Arthur's son whereas in reality those are all roles that you play. And you are the actor who plays all those roles. And in that moment, it was literally like a 10 kilowatt light bulb went on in my head. And I could just see the absolute truth of what she had just said. It was like the voice of the universe speaking to me through a human being. You think you are the roles that you are playing. And in reality, you are the actor who plays all of those different roles. And it was like, I could see that what was pulling me apart is when I'm Jeff the dad, everything revolves around Alexander. When I'm Jeff the consultant, everything revolves around clients. When I'm Jeff the husband, everything revolves around Alison. When I'm Jeff the son, everything revolves around Arthur and Sadie. When I'm Jeff the brother, everything revolves around Mary and Anne. It was just so clear to me, the truth and the deep, deep wisdom that was in this statement. And so, of course, I was fascinated by this understanding because in all of my education, nobody had ever really said anything about what it meant to be me. You know, who is this person that I call me? Who is this being that is right at the center of my experience all the time? whether I'm experiencing myself to be Alexander's dad or the consultant who works for Cambridge Consultants or Alison's husband or, you know, any of those roles. So this was really, um, it, it's not too dramatic to describe this as an epiphany. It literally was an epiphany. It was like the scales fell from my eyes. And in that moment, there was that moment of absolute clarity of awareness Oh my God, I am the actor playing these different roles on the stage of life. And yes, you know, those roles have to play in all sorts of different circumstances. And sometimes the roles are successful and sometimes there's failure and sometimes people like what I'm doing and sometimes people don't like what I'm doing. All of this, but every moment there's me right in the middle of all of that. And, and this... This clarity of awareness was just so brilliant and so beautiful. And I could see in that moment, if I can just stay in this awareness of being the actor, playing the roles that Jeff plays on the great stage of this drama of life, you know, like Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage and men and women are players and we have our exits and entrances. If I could just stay in that awareness, then actually not only would I be able to be more authentic, but be more real, be more calm, be more stable, um, be more uh, balanced, be in more poise, have more access to all of the resources that are there inside me. But when I'm called upon to make the kind of decision that caused me so much stress, what do I do with the 16th of May, 1990? Do I go to Eindhoven for the meeting at Phillips? Or do I stay in Cambridge for Alexander's first birthday? If I'm able to stay out of that conflict and look at those two options, one of the things that becomes very, very clear very, very quickly is you can actually have your cake and eat it too, or in this case, jelly and ice cream because it's one year old birthday party. Um, because all you have to do is move the birthday party 
Like he's one year old. Right? The fact that his birthday party is held on the 18th of May when his birthday is actually the 16th of May does not make the slightest bit of difference, right? But when I was in that stress of, I want to be a good dad because I'm particularly close to my own dad and all this sort of thinking, then I don't have access to that insight that I could just simply, you know, could simply have his birthday party another day, right? And so this was really, really so clear to me. And in that moment, it felt like all of my questions were answered and that this was all that was required was just to maintain this awareness. And of course, that is the challenge because that's when we come on to the second word in today's title, which is awake, you know? because you have that moment of awareness. And in that moment of awareness, you wake up, you wake up to the reality that I am not the roles that I'm playing. You wake up to the truth of the fact that you are this spiritual being, the actor, the soul, if you like, playing the part on the stage of life. But that awareness doesn't stay with you all the time. It's like we get caught up again in action and, and interaction uh, and other people praise you and criticize you. And in all of these things, you get pulled into the awareness of the role. And when you do that, it's like you go back to sleep again. And you only get woken up again when something happens that reminds you, oh, I got caught up in my role again. Right? So, so this is the challenge. And the challenge for all of us is, on the one hand, understanding. But you get the understanding very quickly. You know, the understanding that you are the spiritual being, the actor, playing the part through this physical vehicle, the body, on the stage of life. And it's very easy to understand that. It doesn't, doesn't take an IQ of 154 to understand that. Very, very straightforward to understand that principle and that foundation. The big challenge is remaining awake. And this is where all the other aspects that you hear about on these regular Tuesday talks really come in because things like, I know Madhvi is a great advocate of journaling and um, was saying earlier, you know, about keeping a journal. Great, great way of, of taking things that are inside your head and putting them on paper outside of the self so that you can look at them. And it gives you a, a subtle distance, uh, a subtle detachment from the content of your awareness to be able to write things down and then reflect on them and maybe look at them later when you're in a different state of mind, when you're not so caught up with the content of your consciousness. Um, so that'd be one practice. And clearly the meditation is an absolutely foundational practice, which is, really just cultivating that awareness of the self in a variety of different ways, that, that I am this being, this peaceful being that is able to observe the content of consciousness. And, you know, mindfulness is, is everywhere in our world today, you know, particularly in the corporate space where I, where I operate, um, you know, mindfulness and mindfulness apps and, and encouraging people, you know, the, the mental health issues at work are increasingly challenging, and particularly with covid um, what's happened with COVID and the, and, and the disruption of what we regarded as just normal life. There's a lot of mental health challenges that people now have trying to understand themselves and deal with the fact that many of the things that we took for granted in life um, that we thought were just part of reality, you know, the ability to travel and go, go, go to places, you know, not having to social distance, all these sorts of things, being able to play tennis in the Australian Open if you were good enough to get there. Um, you know, all of these things that we just took for granted and, and, and then we're suddenly challenged to realise, oh, actually, what else am I taking for granted in my life that I think is certain and I think is something that I can rely upon uh, and that it turns out not to be and the foundation of that turns out to be quite, be quite shaky. So that ability to go within and find that place inside the self, to go deep into the self and be able to touch that core of peace of, of serenity of stability even in circumstances and situations that are quite challenging and quite difficult um, and I remember as a kid uh, coming across this poem by Rudyard Kipling probably his most famous poem if um, and I remember the first few lines of it which were if you can keep your head while all around are losing theirs and blaming it on you, you know uh, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters both the same. Now, this is really profound stuff. 
And I could see that what I was learning at the BK Center about knowing the self as a spiritual being, as the actor playing the part on the stage of life, was really going to be absolutely fundamental. And I mean, particularly after that initial epiphany where it's like, oh my God, suddenly for the first time, I now understand what is going on and how it, how it works, how I work. Uh, and, you know, being somebody with an engineering background who was helping my dad take cars apart when I was 12 years old and, uh, you know, doing electronic engineering and then being able to design circuits and write software and all these kind of things. So that ability to analyze and take things apart was something that I found really, really helpful once I'd got this understanding of the self, because, because what it does is it equips you with the ability to deal with certain situations. And, and I mentioned earlier that it, it's often an impediment to meditation to, to be quite thinky, you know, to have this analytical, yeah, kind of thinky way, way of being. I, I remember actually, uh, some of you will have, uh, have encountered uh, either physically or on videos and things, um, a, a wonderful, wonderful soul by the name of Daddy Janky. She, she passed away. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, so a couple of years ago now, at the age of 104, and she was, at the time, the administrative head of the Brahma Kumaris. And I remember meeting her many times over the years. She was based in the UK for many years. And uh, I always remember she came and did a talk at the University Centre here in Cambridge. And the main message that, that she had um, was, uh, or the main message I heard anyway and took away, was... Uh, you Westerners think too much. This is our message. You Westerners, you think too much. And I'm like, I'm going to have to think about that. And then I realized, oh, I'm thinking about the fact that I think too much. I'm going to have to think about how not to think too much. And I was just realizing, oh, it, it, it's quite humorous. At the time, even, it was quite humorous, realizing, oh, my God, you know, so somebody tells me I'm thinking too much and the next thing I do is start thinking about how not to think too much and then I'm thinking about why is it that I'm thinking about thinking too much and you realize I'm just sort of thinking all the time right and this image came to mind I was actually talking to Alex this morning our son working from home these days but um, <laughs> I was talking with him about this so it's a bit like when you when you do it all with thinking it's a bit like you're standing in a bucket right and you're trying to lift yourself up by pulling really hard on the handle and actually, the only way you're going to lift the bucket up is if you get out of the bucket first. And, and in the same way, it's like, if I'm lost in my thinking and I'm using my thinking to think about my thinking, then actually I'm not really going to get anywhere. And it gets very tiring. And you can really have this experience of your thoughts going round and round uh, in ever, ever decreasing circles. Uh, which, of course, was the experience I had, you know, that, that meant that I was off, you know, ended up off work, was just thinking all the time, trying to use my, my thinking to fix my thinking, whereas actually the problem was thinking too much. And so this is the world we live in. And I, and I think it, it's, um, I have to say, I mean, I think it's all getting worse for most people. Uh, we, we just have our attention pulled in so many different directions, you know, by these things. Um, and the fact that they're pinging and, you know, whatever apps you've got on them, they send you a message saying, pay attention to me. And uh, literally before I came on this call just now, this, 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 this session just now, I was looking at, at LinkedIn and uh, one of my friends had posted something about the fact that there are 50,000 50, of the world's best behavioral scientists who are employed by social media platforms, social media companies and digital platforms. And their job, their sole job is to grab and keep yours and my attention on those platforms so that those platforms can make money by putting adverts in front of us. So in the last 15 or 20 years, so much brain power has gone into this idea of capturing and retaining our attention. So it becomes even more important for us to remain aware and awake to the danger of being sucked into these things. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't use them. I'm not saying that you just completely reject technology and become kind of a Luddite, you know, like Jacob Ludd and his gang used to go around smashing up machinery in factories in the early days because they thought, you know, it was the end of their world. No, not like that. 
But in fact, to turn the tables on these behavioral scientists who are busy trying to capture your attention. And so one of the things I do quite a lot is if my phone pings or if on my computer, um, it tells me I've got some posts that I should pay attention to. It's usually on LinkedIn. I mean, on, I, I don't use Facebook very much, but uh, on my PC here with Facebook, I have something called Newsfeed Eradicator, which is a little app that stops Facebook putting things in front of you unless you deliberately go and look at it. Um, but, but with LinkedIn or with my phone, uh, things come up, that little red circle with a number inside it, three, you know, you've got three important things to, to go and look at, which will turn out to be not very important, but still it works. You know, they've, they've worked out how to grab our attention. So what I do with this is when it pings or when the number goes up, I deliberately don't go look at it straight away. I use the fact that I've noticed the little number popping up or the little ping going off on the phone to just have a moment or two of focused attention, of awareness, if you want to call it this, of meditation, which is just to remind myself in that moment who I am. I am the actor, the spiritual being, the soul, the being of silence, the being of light, the being of energy, playing the part, the various parts that I play through this character of Jeff. And just after a second or two of that experience, making sure I actually experience it, not just create the thought, because that's the difference between being aware and being awake. Just, just wake up for that second or so. Use that prompt as a trigger to make me wake up for a second or two. And then decide, am I going to go and look at that right now? Or am I going to invest my attention in the thing that I'm already working on? And so... What that's doing is that's building up that muscle of being aware and being awake. And in that way, I think I'm benefiting from those 50,000 behavior, behavioral scientists who are trying to draw my attention to what they want me to draw my attention to. And I'm using their prompts to draw my attention to what I want to draw my attention to, which is who I really am, because it's in that awareness of who I really am that I become awake. And in becoming awake, I'm more able to make sense of things and make good decisions and take good actions that are in my interest, that are what I want to do with my life, rather than ending up becoming a pawn in somebody else's game, you know, that they're moving me around on their chessboard. So I think these kinds of things that are about, on the one hand, we have the awareness, we have the understanding, but to maintain that awareness and to bring it alive, we need to do this practice of regularly becoming awake. And again, in the preamble conversation, I know several people were saying, you know, even after 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years of practice, there are still times where one is not connected with oneself where one's not aware uh, and I would echo that you know 30 odd years um, but the question is what do I do the moment I become aware that that is the case the moment I become aware that that is the case in that moment I've woken up and this is so important to really understand this right the very the very just in the instant that you realize that you had lost your awareness, that you were caught up in the role, that you had been caught up in the, the great drama of life. The moment you spot it, in that moment, you are awake. It's not that you, in that moment, go, oh, I ought to be awake, because that's you're back into your thinking again. You're back into thinking about what you ought to do, and you're back caught up into the role and the, you know, the, the, the mind's creation. It's just remaining aware. Oh, right, okay. I'm just reminding myself that that is who I am. And it's in that moment of reminding myself who I am, a little bit more energy, a little bit more charge, a little bit more current, if you like. And, um, you know, the, the battery, the spiritual battery in that moment is being recharged. And the wonderful thing about this is, is that as you develop that practice of connection, connection with yourself, connection with who you are as a soul, connection with the divine, which, which happens automatically, you know, the moment you are connected with who you really are, the moment you are connected 
with that higher source of energy, whether you call it God, the divine, the universe, universal consciousness, you know, whatever framing you put on it. In that moment, you are charging your battery and that charging of the battery is disproportionately greater than the discharging. So you can spend an hour caught up in the great drama of life, caught up in your role. You take a minute and you connect for a minute and that will compensate for that hour of having been caught up in things. And so that recognition of the, of the disproportionate benefit of taking just a little bit of time every so often to make that connection and recharge. Um, or you can think of it as like a muscle, you know, building a muscle. You do a little bit of exercise every so often, maybe lifting a little bit more weight or holding the weight for a little bit longer. And what happens is you're able to build up the muscle over time. And the more you build the muscle, the easier it gets to build the muscle. In the same way, the more you remain awake, the easier it becomes to remain awake. And so these are bits of practice, little, little tips, little ideas that we can use to maintain the awareness by remaining awake. Because again, because of our education system, there is a pervasive illusion that says, once you've understood something, that's the job done. I see this so much in organizations. Somebody goes on a course about leadership and they think because they've done this course and they can tell you something that they learned about leadership, that they're now actually practicing what they learned. And yet there's, a, there's this illusion that just because we know something, we're doing it. So we have to actually pay attention to what is going on within the self. We have to check, um, to check and change. So it's check, what is my awareness in this moment? Right now, as I'm speaking to you, I'm checking, am I getting caught up in being Jeff, the BK speaker at Wands on the 18th of January, 2022? Or am I maintaining the awareness that I am the actor playing the part of Jeff doing the one session on Tuesday, the 18th of January, 2022. And it's only, you know, I'm the only one who can make that effort for myself. You're the only one who can make the equivalent effort of yourself. And it really is just a matter of paying attention and noticing where do I get caught? When have I got caught? And the moment I notice where I've got caught, I'm no longer caught. So that combined with the connection combined with the developing the muscle, all of these metaphors, all of these ideas, all of these methods are ways in which to build up that muscle of, we would refer to as soul consciousness, the consciousness of the self as the spiritual actor playing the part, different parts on the stage of life. And the contrast between that soul consciousness and role consciousness, which is where I'm in the role of Jeff the dad, and so everything is about Alex. I'm in the role of Jeff the husband, so everything is about Alison. I'm in the role of Jeff the brother, so everything is around Anne and Mary. And by paying attention to what's going on in my head, where are my thoughts going? That's how I know where I'm being caught up, and that's how I'm able to step back into this awareness of soul consciousness and develop that capacity to remain in that awareness more consistently. And when I'm pulled out of it by circumstances, either positive circumstances that make me role conscious or challenging circumstances that make me role conscious, I'm able to stay more resiliently self-conscious. But when I lose it, I'm able to get it back quickly. So this is the practice. This is the remaining awake that is cultivated with this understanding and with application. So really this is what I wanted to mainly talk about today. This is actually one other thing. Um, again, I was talking with Alex about it, this, our son about this this morning. Um, you know, he, he works in quite a high pressure industry. He does some um, visual effects for movies and it's quite a high stress, uh, high pace industry. Clients are always changing their minds. There's always new things coming in. There's always technical challenges, all this sort of stuff. And we, we were talking about this ability to stay role conscious versus soul conscious. And I was remembering an old friend uh, 
um, BK, who I used to know for many, many years. She passed away a couple of years ago herself. Some, some of you may know her. Um, Joyce, she was one of the first people to be at the retreat centre in Oxford uh, when that opened 28 years ago. And then um, she uh, unfortunately had um, it was Alzheimer's, some degenerative condition, and, and was for the last few years of her life was based in the retreat place down in Worthing. But I remember her giving this class once and she had this broad Birmingham accent. So um, she, she would say, um, you know, you've got to think about this as being a game, like, you know, do you know what I mean? It's a game. And I remember saying to her, you just don't know. I mean, I had this experience of a boss uh, who was very, very challenging, a um, guy called Frank. And I, 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 she said this thing about, you have to see this all as a game. I won't do this, I won't do my Birmingham accent, um, in case there's anyone there from Birmingham and it's offensive to you because it's a very good one. Um, but um, she said, you have to understand that this is a game. And I, I said, it doesn't feel like a game. You know, Frank walks into the room and you feel your heart sink and it's like, you know, <laughs> sink so low that you have to kind of jack it up from the floor in order just to get it back into your in, into your body again um but she said no you really need to understand the nature of the game she said it's very specific this game right so what the game is is uh, it's about the game of role consciousness and soul consciousness that's the essence of the game and she said so you and frank are in the game right you're on different sides of the of the game like in a football match, you know, Chelsea versus Arsenal or Liverpool versus Manchester United or whatever. And um, Frank's role in the game is to remain resolutely role conscious. You know, he's got to stay in the consciousness that I am the division manager. And in doing that, what he's trying to do is pull you, and kind of got a gravitational pull from his being so resolute in his awareness of being the role of the division manager. That, that his job is to pull you into role consciousness. So the awareness of being group leader and the group leader was here and the division manager's here. So if he manages to pull you into your role consciousness, then he's already at an advantage because hierarchically in the organization, the division manager is more powerful than the group leader. So this is why he wants to pull you into role consciousness. Your role in the game on the opposite side of the pitch is to remain soul conscious and to see him as a soul playing his part of the division manager. So my role in the game is I am a soul spiritual actor playing the role of Jeff, the group leader. He is a soul spiritual actor playing the role of Frank, the division manager. His role in the game, I'm the division manager. Jeff is the group leader. And then it becomes a question of, in our interactions, how much do I stay soul conscious versus how much do I get pulled into role consciousness? And so what she said was, just try this the next time you're interacting with him. See how often he manages to pull you into role consciousness. And every time he manages to pull you into role consciousness, he gets a point, right? We I mean, don't tell him that's one point to you, Frank. I mean, you're keeping this tally inside your head. So every time he pulls you into role consciousness, which, for example, he comes in and he says, um, that presentation that you did to such and such a client last week, I, I don't think it was very good. Now, if I feel that I'm being attacked, if I feel, oh, oh my God, you know, what, what's, what's that about? What, or, you know, what, what did I do wrong or whatever? He has pulled me into role consciousness. On the other hand, if he comes in and says, well, that presentation you did last week wasn't very good. If I'm staying soul conscious, what will happen is I will see him doing that and I'll go, aha, I can see your cunning tactic there, young man. A bit older than me, but you get the point. I can see your cunning tactic trying to pull me into role consciousness. And from that position, I can say to him, what was it about the presentation last week that you didn't like? And I'm staying in my power when I do that. I'm not saying, what do you say? No, 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 I'm not having a go at him and I'm not being crushed, right? I'm staying completely neutral about what he's saying. And that puts me in the most powerful position I can be in, in terms of my inner strength, my inner resourcefulness, my inner balance, my inner stability. And so he then says something about why he thinks, you know, the problem is the client. Blah, blah, blah. But anyway, the point is this. In the next few interactions, what happened was 
maybe out of six incidents that I noticed going on between us, uh, the first time out, uh, you know, he won 5 1. You know, five times he managed to pull me into role consciousness. And each time he did, I'm like, oh, rats, it's another goal to him, right? Another point to him. But the beauty of it is in, in the fact that you are aware that that's what's going on, that, that he's managed to do that to you, you're noticing it. The moment you notice it, you're self conscious. The moment you notice it, you are not role conscious. If, if you are role conscious, you don't notice it, right? That's the thing. You, you, you've fallen asleep. You're not awake. You're not awake to the fact that you have been pulled into this body consciousness, into this role consciousness. And so the very fact that he scored five and I only scored one, I could look at that and say, oh, that was a terrible outcome. But the fact is it felt entirely different. And what's more, there was one time where he tried to pull me and I'd managed to stay soul conscious. And of course, based on that experience, the next time we interact, it's more like three, two to him. And then it becomes two all, and then it becomes four, one to me, and then it becomes five nil to me. And then gradually it becomes very, very rare that he actually manages to pull me into role consciousness. Of course, if I'm not attentive and if I'm sleepwalking around in my day and he says something and catches my attention and whatever, then I get caught, right? But then what that's doing is it's reminding me that I need to be attentive. I need to pay attention to my own inner state, how I'm turning up, how I'm interacting to make sure that I am being as resourceful as I can be. But this practice that, that Joyce mentioned was so powerful, I have to tell you, because up to that point, it was kind of like this was theory. I was aware of the theory, but I couldn't stay awake to its power. But when she said, you see this as a game and the game is his job is to make you role conscious. Your job is to remain soul conscious. Then that's where you discover the power that you already have at your, at your disposal. And so um, I really encourage you, you know, to, to reflect on what we've talked about today, uh, what I've talked about today, uh, and also some of the practices that you can apply both in terms of some of the things that I've just suggested, but also the things that you've heard about on previous one sessions or can hear on the recordings that, that Mabby puts out. Um, and, you know, apply them to yourself and practice them. And you'll see that you have a lot more power and a lot more resourcefulness than maybe you currently think you have, or maybe you believed before. And I mean, if you look at the turnaround that happened to me, it didn't take very long to get from being in this complete mess before I was signed off by my doctor to actually being really curious and intrigued about how I could apply these things in my everyday life. And then gradually, gradually, as that ability to apply them in practice grew, then it became a lot easier to stay in that more meditative state. And then when I sit for meditation, to be able to connect and to be able to draw that power and, and, and re-energize the self. Um, so, you know, I can say change my life. It certainly changed my life. Uh, it continues to change my life 30 odd years on, um, which is why it's a great pleasure and privilege to share some of my ideas with you today.